Welcome to the Directing Animation Livecast with Scott Weiser. In my many years as an animator and director, my most defining projects have been my short film, Layers, along with Vanishing Ink and Cirque de Solitude, two books which I wrote, illustrated, and pitched at several studios as feature films. And I have more of these feature film pitches coming soon. Today our guest is the wonderful Arnie Leibovit. He is somebody who I am so glad that I discovered because he is an expert on the animation animator and director George Pal. If you don't know who George Pal is, it's a shame. And Arnie and I have already discussed how interconnected he is with the entire industry. He inspired Disney. He worked with Disney. He inspired the nine old men. Arnie knows four of the nine old men, which is, is wonderful, and we'll get into that as well. But before we do that, we'd like to show a trailer of the big project that Arnie has been working on directing. It's a documentary called Puppet Tune 2. So there's already one out. It's about George Powell's work. And uh, we're going to show that to you now. For those of you who can't see this, because we also have an audio version of this live cast, this work that we're seeing here is work that is stop motion. If you've ever seen movies like the Leica films or the old Christmas films like um, Frosty the Snowman and Santa Claus is Coming to Town, it's in that genre, but this is strictly wood dolls moving around. And anytime the face changes, we have Bugs Bunny here, but anytime the face changes, that's actually a new wood doll that George Powell made. It's incredible work. And uh, yeah, would you like to comment in on it at all? Tell us no, it's hard for me. I don't. I'm not, can't see it at the moment. But oh, you uh, can't. We're at the moment where uh, we have a lion juggling. <laughs> so. Okay, that's World of the Lion. We also have animation that looks hand drawn. There was a bunch of like light bulbs walking along or something. They are. That's yeah. Pal did hand drawn animation and stop motion. Oh, okay. So uh, he started out as an animator. We can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, tap dancing shoes. Yep, yep. <laughs> and the horse is incredible. His mouth, the way it moved. Hat full of dreams. It's one of his masterpieces. Yeah, you have a beating heart from. Uh, I think that heart's incredible. That was several different hearts that he made out of wood that he had to make. And this face with the guy blowing a kiss. You now know, there are several. Jim Dandy from uh, Gypsy Gypsy and from Day 90, I believe. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And we have a little guy riding a camel or something through a desert. I thought that yep, animation yep. was really smooth. Alibaba and the 40 Thieves. Okay. That was a major, major discovery. Yeah. Never been seen before in, by American audiences, probably. Yeah. So yeah, that was incredible, incredible amount of work, especially back then when he, all he had was wood dolls and a and lighting and a camera, you know, <laughs> and uh, it's it's incredible. So pretty much, is it over now? It is over now. Yes. Yeah, and, and yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Pal actually started as an animator. He was a he studied to be an architect. Oh. And um, he, uh, 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 but at the time he went to the Budapest Academy of the Arts. And uh, he, he, as he said, there was nothing to build. So uh, <laughs> he became an animator because he could draw because he was studied carpentry and in and, and, and architecture, you learn how to draw. So he had a talent. Uh, he, uh, he said he didn't want, didn't uh, want have any, anything to do with the stage, but the stage found him in a big way. Mm -hmm. But he animated cartoon uh, posters and uh, hand drawings and eventually led to animation. And uh, that led him to uh, Hunia Studios, this is the 1930s, and then to uh, Ufa in Germany, which was the largest film studio in Europe. And he became the head of the animation department. Uh, it was only 21 years old. Right. So he obviously had great talent. He was prolific and a bit of a prodigy, no doubt. And he ran the studio and he made a lot of films there. And uh, the Nazis were snooping on him, of course, at the time. Hmm. And uh, uh, there was an incident that occurred, and it made them realize they had to leave Germany to get out of there. And he was all his whole history is 
you know, one step ahead of the of the Nazis, it seems. Went to Paris, Czechoslovakia, Prague, and eventually to Eindhoven, Holland, which is where he really based his major animation studio for uh, at least uh, seven, six or seven years. And he uh, he did these incredible story films. They were commercial films, kind of like what you've done, commercials, but they were seen on movie theaters. They were seen on screens, like commercials are seen on television today. But he turned them into story films. Yeah. Rather than store, rather than commercials, the audiences loved them. So the Phillips Company, which sponsored them, uh, let him just do what he wanted to do, and he made these wonderful story films. And um, he became known as the Walt Disney of Europe. Oh. Uh, and uh, oh. Qu quite a reputation. Eventually, he was invited to Hollywood. He wanted to move to uh, the United States, and uh, he did. He met with Walt Disney, met with many animators, and uh, set up. Uh, the Puppetoons in at Paramount Studios. Uh, that was in 1939, 1940, and that lasted for about a decade. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, eventually won the Academy Award in 1944 for the Puppetoons, and uh, became a sensation. We can talk uh, more about them as we go, but the um, they were really a revelation for the American audience. They'd never seen anything like it before. Right. Remember, this is 1940. Yeah. You know, you're watching uh, 1940 movies, um, uh, and all of a sudden a puppet tune comes on the screen. Right. And I have talked to uh, people who were alive then who saw these films. Uh, they're passed away now. But when a puppet tune came on the screen in the 1940s, the audience applauded. Uh, they couldn't believe it. It was a sensational thing to see these moving dimensional characters. Yeah. And of course, and it was Walt like CG Disney animation came. It, you know, years, years later, earlier. You know? Right. I mean, it, it, it was like the forerunner to what we see today. Mm -hmm. But it really got the attention of Walt Disney, which I think is, um, uh, which is sort of the, an interesting and important story, uh, because uh, Walt uh, was always trying to um, to do three dimensional animation, first starting with his cartoons, and then of course Snow White, as you know, used the triple plane uh, triple plane animation stand. Yeah, the camera. He was trying to give dimensionality to the um, animation. Mm -hmm. And here comes along George Powell's Puppetoons in the 1930s, at the same time he's doing Snow White, basically. Mm -hmm. And for him, it was a revelation. And, and because of that, um, he really brought in the Puppetoons to the studio to be seen by the animators. Right. And <laughs> had a great influence at the studio. Uh, and um, and you can see that clearly in yeah. the animation. And you can see an obvious influence in the theme parks, and especially the obvious... with It's a Small World. and That's correct. Yeah. And, and many other. And Roy Disney was a friend for many years, you know, talked to me about it, <laughs> uh, as did some of the Nine Old Men, uh, which is where I got a lot of the uh, direct information from. Uh, uh, Ward Kimball, in particular, who was uh, creator of uh, uh, Jiminy Cricket, and uh, he did, um, oh, he did so many things. He was the Ch Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> uh, he did so many wonderful character animations and comedy. He was really a genius. Uh, he was one of the one of the few animators that Walt called a genius. Wow. Um, you know, great sense of humor. <laughs> and um, and Ward told me about how these films were shown to the animators at the studio, and the extremely influential um and speaking of ward by the way i just happen to have a a book here some of you may have seen this uh, it's called the the art of walt disney yeah and uh and ward signed it for me and <laughs> he did a, a rare not a great jiminy but he did a jiminy for me on the uh in the book uh, that i love was his, his self caricature there is that his thumbprint too his put his... thumbprint oh, nice. that's his signature and uh of course jiminy jiminy crick and that's a yeah a, a treasure to me to have that and uh, huh. uh he was really a remarkable uh guy and um and so so to the other animators uh that i was very fortunate to have known yeah. Uh, Mark Davis in particular, who was uh, Tinkerbell. Yeah. And um, Maleficent from Sleeping Beauty. 
uh, and uh, Bambi. Uh, mm -hmm. He did all sorts of things. He was a wonderful animator. And uh, he also told me a great deal about the influence of uh, George. Yeah. And uh, so it's, a, it, it, it's very interesting, the interconnection. Um, I think the most important connection, though, for the Puppetoons is uh, Fred Moore. Yeah. And uh, maybe maybe some of you know who Fred Moore was, but Fred was uh, considered one of the greatest of the of the Disney animators. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the character designer, and he's most well known for designing the uh, the supervising the seven dwarfs in Snow White. Uh, I mean, that's probably his claim to fame. Right. A uh, bigger claim to fame is the identity of Mickey Mouse himself. Yeah. The best Mickey Mouse, the one that we're the one that I love, I don't know about your audience, but the one that is most important to me was the Mickey during the period of um, a brave little t brave little tailor and um, the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Mm -hmm. and so oh, I Mickey, love that one for sure. Yeah, yeah. That's the Mickey that Fred designed. That is yeah. the most important of, of the Mickeys. Yeah. And so Fred, what's interesting about Fred is he ended up working at the Puppetoon Studios. Uh, in the 1940s, Walt and George were friends. They trade. They had lunches every month, and they traded stories and and talent. And in those days, everything was done sort of as a gentleman's agreement. Animators kind of went from studio to studio. Mm -hmm. It isn't like today. It's a very business world. <laughs> Back then, it was a very artistic world. Yeah. And they traded animators. They traded different uh, ideas. They were very very um, uh, accommodating to each other yeah. in terms of different story, different things they were working on. And it just wasn't as possessive as it is today. The egos were tamped down by, oh, yeah. by, by I've many. heard about the medical industry as well, That about the man who co-created the heart-lung machine that makes mm -hmm. heart surgery possible. And uh, it was just very interesting. It was very similar to that. And there were no egos, and it wasn't like... Oh, if I share this, then I'm going to lose money. It was like you were sharing with everybody you could all the information you had, and they were sharing the information with you. And it was, it was actually a kind of a golden age in in a way. It's a golden age because that's why things there was such a a, a burgeoning and a blossoming of so much wonderful material, so much different than we see today. Yeah, uh, people had an opportunity to do things. They were able to experiment. They were able to try things. Uh, going, working at the studios and working in those environments was like like going to film school today. Yeah, you you kind of learned it as you were doing, but then you also had the benefit of the financing of the studio. Now you weren't making, you weren't your sometimes you weren't your own identity. You weren't always a George Pal or a Walt Disney, yeah. but you you know you worked as a cog in those environments. Mm -hmm. But you had great opportunities to do a wonderful uh, creative work. Yeah. Um, now this, by the way, this is the cover for the Puppetoon movie volume two, which is. Which yes, I was going to ask you to hold that up for sure. Yeah. And there yeah, are links just, down in our description on both the audio version and the YouTube version where you can go and you can see those. You can follow the Facebook pages and you can get a copy of that because. It's a Puppetoon.net. Puppetoon.net. Yeah, put it in front easy. of your face for a bit. What? Just move it over in front of your face. There we go. Now we can see it. Oh, you can see it. You don't see a reflection. I do see a reflection, but it's a okay. it's a nice reflection. Oh, you don't mind the reflection? I okay. don't mind it yet. Uh, now, the reason I'm showing the cover, aside from because this is the release, uh, that is a Fred Moore design. Yes, it looks like a Fred Moore design. <laughs> yeah, you can see it. You can see it very clearly. The yeah. design. That two characters are Punchy and Judy. Yeah. And featured in uh, two puppetoons. One of them is on this set called Hatful of Dreams, which I consider one of, uh, if not one of George's great masterpiece, Pumpetoons. Uh, what makes it special, of course, is um, it, uh, it's coming from a successive negative uh, from Paramount. Uh, some of these come directly from the successive negatives from wow. the studio. These are the original negatives in their vaults <laughs> that have been scanned and restored so there's no uh, degrading of the image. It's as clear as if you're looking at glass. It's so beautiful. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's featured in Hatful of Dreams is Superman. Uh, it was the first use of Superman outside of the Max Fleischer uh, 
Tom, uh, Pat Max Fleischer Superman cartoon. Right. And uh, Punchy is dressed up as Superman. And uh, again, it's the only time that DC Comics ever allowed Superman to be used outside of DC Comics. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and that wasn't that was not unusual for Pal. He used a lot of things, uh, like Bugs Bunny, you saw in the trailer. Uh, he's in Jasper Goes Hunting, and it was the only time Warner Brothers ever allowed uh, Bugs Bunny to be appear outside of a Warner Brothers cartoon. <laughs> Until Roger Rabbit, essentially, there was a there was a mo- there was a couple of things where Bugs had made appearances, but uh, certainly nothing as beautiful as the Robert McKinson animation of Bugs Bunny in uh, in uh, Jasper Goes Honey. Because McKinson really, again, he was like more in many ways. He gave uh, the character that beautiful rounded look, uh, that sort of dimensionality to it. Uh, which Bugs had, and of course Mickey had that too, that wonderful dimensional feel. And uh, that's, I, I think amongst the animators, uh, McKimson, uh, I think, rises to the top yeah. of the great Warner Brother uh, animators, uh, as Fred was in uh, with Walt Disney. You know, Arnie, I'm so glad you reached out to me about being on this show, because as I'm listening to you, um, the, the kind of scrappy you're learning and you're growing and that sort of thing. It, what you're discussing is, is something that I've, I've definitely experienced, but I've worked inside the studios and outside the studios. And it seems like when you're freelancing and you're outside the studios and you have various clients, you know, sometimes I'm doing Scott Weiser work and sometimes I'm doing work that is for other people. And at the same time, I'm learning and growing and, and on all this stuff. And you get to experiment more when you, when you have like very low budgets and, and, and it's not as flashy. It's not as flashy, but there's so much to be learned. And, you know, if, if anything, I will be talking about George Powell probably for the rest of my career, just plugging, mm-hmm. plugging this idea that there are things about animation, there are things about the art of storytelling that we forget, and it's at a cost. Mm-hmm. I'm a big proponent of black, black and white films. Yeah. And, you know, my favorite films are made by Frank Capra and Billy Wilder and, you know, just these... But, and nothing, nothing storytelling wise, well, most things storytelling wise aren't on the same level nowadays. And it's because it was just a different time. There wasn't a big, as big of an emphasis on looking just like perfect and having the, the biggest spectacular, like perfect imagery up on the screen. It was more about storytelling. And uh, I know we talked about on the phone before we, uh, before we today, about the idea of things that are lost that I just, we both alluded to in this. You've been exposed to several different directors, you know, classical animation directors, Walt Disney himself. What things do you wish directors of animation were remembering about the past? What things do you think are almost about to be lost or have been lost? I think, um, I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, I think it's a uh, story. Uh huh. Um, it's story, and and what is story? Um, story, to me, at least from my perspective, is um, things that relate to our personal personal experiences that reach deep into the heart. Mm-hmm. Things that have the most profound effect, and the things that I'm always striving for, and and things I'm work that I try to work on are things that. Uh, kind of recapture where it really comes from. I, I, I know Frank Capra's work, uh, and I think this re, this resembles a bit of that sensibility, uh, and Pal had that, and so did uh, Disney, is um, uh, there's that sense of uh, boyhood wonder. Oh, yeah. Uh, the sense of awe that you have, and, it, and a lot of it comes, a lot of your uh, listeners and viewers uh, might might relate to this, but a lot of the things that happen in our lives uh, come come from childhood. Yes, come from our early years mm-hmm. as we're growing up, and especially uh, at certain pivotal years as transitions in our lives. And for me, I'm always thinking of the twelve year old or the um, the nine year old and the twelve year old. That period it's it's a very special period in your life. That is, you, you think about it, isn't it? It's what R.L. Stein about, writes for. 
And he and yeah. I, I listened to his masterclass. And he talked about how that age group is just right, and it's just the right. He's it's his favorite age group of all. It's time. something about the maturation that happens, and just touching into that awe-inspiring moments for me. Of course, I can relate to let's say George Powell and Walt Disney because I grew up with them. Yeah. I mean, I grew up watching them as a kid. I I know what those experiences were, and I talked to other people similarly so i know what where i was when i was nine years old well i was in a movie theater watching sleeping beauty because it came out in 1959 uh and in 1960 uh the time machine came out and so it became a uh pivotal period for me where it literally changed my life these 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 collision of forces of fantasy of uh, futurism of animation, of special effects. So when we talk about story, going back to your question, what I like to think about is going back to those feelings of the child, the things that you, the things you wish, the things you want, the things you dream about, the things that make you, uh, give you pleasure. Mm -hmm. And and along with pleasure comes pain. Yes. <laughs> because nothing works by itself. Right. There's there's that, and, and and I know you're a fan of Chaplin. Yes. And uh, he best expressed that tragedy, the uh, the the poor the poor man, the the orphan, the uh, the child, the, kid. the dog. Yeah. It was always it was always trying to play up to the best of us by sometimes showing the worst things that happened to us. Huh. Because, but if you if you have gone through a crisis in your life, if you experienced a tragedy. And I've experienced many in my life. Right. Those are the things that give you growth. Yes. So when you talk about story, you want to go back to those things, the things that that the, the period of crisis that you that you uh, lived through and then you transformed from it. Yeah. And you learned from it. Huh. That's what Capra does. That's what Billy Wilder did. That's what George Powell did. That's what Walt Disney yeah. does. And so the, the idea is you want to tap into those things that we relate to, and then you want to show, for me, of course, and with Pal, it, it's so, and Disney, um, the positive view, because yeah. I have a yeah. positive view of the world. I can tell. <laughs> I, I see the world in a different set of eyes than other people see it. Yeah. I see the, the, the glass, you know, half full, you know, as a, I mean, I see that world that's, um, uh, with great the great potentials yeah of the world yeah and and that's that's the view I see for for film uh, storytelling is is a message that touches the heart mm -hmm. and uh, gives you joy and pleasure but at the end of the day uh, you feel like living is it is worth the trip it is worth the journey to be alive and you have so much to look forward to there's so much ahead of you there's mm -hmm. so much wonders about around us. The wonders of the universe. Yeah. That's the feeling you want to get in your story. That's a very that inspiring monologue you just gave. And I actually, I mean, I can't mention what it is on the air, but the, I have a pitch that I've been working on that you'd love. <laughs> okay. I can't wait to hear it. It like embodies what you were talking about. And it, it will inspire the pitch. There oh, were several good. different things that were lighting up in my brain as you spoke that I was like, ooh, ah, ah, I like that. <laughs> you know? So... It it Thank you for the inspiration. Will. I think the, uh, the the bottom line is to really uh, feel you want to do things you love. You've mm -hmm. heard this a thousand times. Yeah. People always say, why do you do this? Why do you do that? You know, things you love, things that mean something to you. Uh, the George Powell phenomenon, it happened to me. Um, I grew up with Powell and Disney, and they became a bit pivotal part of my life. I ended up knowing meeting these people, becoming, interacting with those things I loved in my life so much. But those are the things that I spent my time, my journey was was moving in those directions. Uh, the things that meant most to me, I dedicated myself to. And a lot of other things, you know, a lot of people that said, well, why didn't you do this? And why didn't you do that? <laughs> well, other people, maybe that's good for other people. They want to do those things. I have to stick to the things that I believed in and the things that I love. Yeah. And, and that's what you have to do in your life, and and, uh, and and especially in animation. Pixar, actually, since we're talking that, Pixar 
has done a wonderful job. Yes, they have. Yeah. Of really uh, tapping into wonderful stories of heart and 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 story and and humor, great sense of humor. Of course, that's very important. I didn't mention you can't lose the the comic the comic element. No, you that's, can't. <laughs> that's critical. Mm -hmm. But that combined with heart and uh, empathy and the um, and the emotion uh, and the story the story formats of Pixar, of course, are really uh, you know. Uh, they're really great templates. Yes. They're really wonderful templates. Uh, so um, uh, that might be something that some of your uh, uh, viewers, you know, already, uh, uh, already, uh, you know, move in the, we're moving in that direction. But yeah, I just wanted to mention that. No, it's it's excellent, and it's funny, you know, Pixar. I, I think we all Pixar's in all of our brains, right? Because a lot of us, a lot of people I talk to in animation who I've worked with said they got into animation because of Toy Story. Uh, that's not my story. My story is I did a lot of theater, I did a lot of art, I did a lot of just creating things, and I wanted to write books and make movies and make stage plays and be on Broadway and just all this stuff. Like, And it, my intro to animation was my dad suggested that I would be good at that Pixar stuff. <laughs> that's really what he said. He didn't even know it was called animation. I had no idea it was called animation. It was the Pixar stuff. And I, I had collected all the Pixar movies, right? And uh, yeah, I at the time because I thought that I needed to get a practical career, I I actually thought it was a bad idea. <laughs> and uh, but over time, like every time I looked at something to do with animation, and one of the books was the uh, one Frank and Ollie wrote, "The Illusion of Life," that mm -hmm. I got. Once I got that book, I was hooked. I just I couldn't. I couldn't do anything but animation at that point, even though I devoted my life to musical theater. And uh, yeah, it's it's been a remarkable journey, for it's sure. Interesting you attract. It's interesting that animation, you, you hit on something indirectly, something I talk about quite a bit, is that uh, that merging of animation, people of animation that move into other worlds, other future worlds and other ideas. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how the world of animation is so inspiring and the best examples, again, I go back to Walt Disney, I go back to George Powell. Uh, George Powell started making puppet tunes mm -hmm. uh, that were three-dimensional figures, uh, the series puppet, like you mentioned, thousands of puppets created for a film, yeah. tremendously craft, tremendous time-consuming work. Uh, and then eventually he moves off, as he said, he wanted to take off his short pants and put on his long pants <laughs> and make features, Yeah, feature films. Right. And so he made Destination Moon, which was the first science fiction film about space. Mm -hmm. It was a futurist, a futurism, world of futurism. Ward Kimball really spoke great, uh, greatly to me because he uh, was so impressed by that, as many have, uh, Ray Bradbury, Ray Harryhausen, all these people that were inspired by George Powell's Destination Moon, which led to uh, When Worlds Collide and War of the Worlds and a Time Machine. It's like he started with animation and he goes into future worlds of science fiction and fantasy. Uh, the Disney similarly did this with uh, his animation. Yes, and he did. Feature films and three dimensionality and eventually into uh, Disney World and Disneyland, uh, a three dimensional representation of the future that comes from the mind of the animator, uh, the mm -hmm. sense of animation and all that. And I just find that to be a, an interesting uh, parallel uh of animation to futurism and um and and the vision it's oh there's almost a sense of visionary there's a visionary quality for many people who are animators uh i can't really quite explain it yeah but there's a visionary quality that takes us into future worlds and and other possibilities mm -hmm. is what i'm getting at and uh and so they though these two of course the great masters and uh, one of a kind, but I think it, it sort of it became a clear relationship to me that I thought was very very interesting, um, and uh, was was heralded by Roy Disney, uh, Disney's nephew, talked to me about it, as the other animators, and yeah. uh, Frank and Ollie, and Mark Davis and Ward, and um, and they were they were really remarkable. Frank and Ollie did a lot of uh, Bambi, Fantasia, Dumbo. Mm -hmm. 
they were just great. They were good at the round, cuddly things. <laughs> yeah, they were just they were just amazing. In fact, I have a, another artifact I can show of some signatures. Let me see if I can find it here. Another book that it was a similar book, but my friend over at Disney, I wanted to be sure I got them. Of course, I knew uh, Mark quite well, and um, he was uh, really a sweet man. <laughs> So this was, uh, this is. Uh, oh, several signatures. We've got Mark, we've got Frank. Ollie Johnson, oh. we have Ward Kimball, and then I'm guessing it's Frank Thomas. It's Frank on, Thomas, on left. Ollie Johnson, Ward Kimball, and For Mark. For Arnie Leibovit. <laughs> yeah. nice. No, that was a, that's a, another treasure for me. Yeah. So very sad if all of them are gone now, of course. It's very sad. I would love to have them on the show. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. The stories they could tell. They were such wonderful people. Yeah. Uh, wonderful storytellers, the sweetest men, um, really original thinkers, all of them, original thinkers, very genuine of uh, human beings. Um, again, very selfless, self-effacing individuals, all, most of these people. Uh, uh, just wonderful uh, artists and craftsmen who did the work, did a wonderful job at it, uh, and were just uh, wonderful gentlemen at the same time. Just mm -hmm. great men. Yeah. Uh, so that's important. You want to stay true to yourself, and you want to be a decent. You want to be decent while you're doing this. You don't want to turn into. A, well, we know some of those stories. But, we do. Uh, we do. <laughs> <laughs> And every once in a while, I wonder if we've lost that uh, that goodness and, and being great to work with in the animation industry. But then all the time I do run into these people that are just genuine and surprise me. And and it's wonderful that, that animation still is attracting those kinds of people. Well, animation sure. is a great place to be. I mean, it really is mm -hmm. a wonderful uh, creative yeah. environment for uh, for you. And um, and I know so many of the animators. It's a wonderful place. It's exciting creative uh and it's art artistic of course you get to express yourself in a very private way uh, in a movie of course you're under the uh to you know under the tutelage of various people and you have to do your specific character your specific uh idea but uh it's very expressive it's very creative mm -hmm. oh yeah oh yeah you can learn and grow a ton well, I, I usually, at this point of the show, I ask a question that's called the Get Wiser Moment. You've already touched on it, actually. <laughs> Naturally. And that shows a lot about you. Actually, that shows a lot about a lot of my guests. A lot of times they, they, they bring it in, and it's like, oh, I was going to ask about that. But, um, and that, that question is, if my goal is to get the greatest potency of truth, clarity of truth, purity of truth into a story, what approach would you suggest now you already touched on that a bit by you know trying to bottle that 9 to 12, 12 year old age of wonder what it's like to be in wonder uh, what it's like to be true to yourself to uh, show the the pleasure that we have along with the great pain that comes with it and uh, is there anything else you'd like to add <laughs> to that to answer that question I uh... I I wish I could. I don't know. What, I, I I think it pretty well ex, it expresses for me the sense that I feel that what you want to do most is you want it when you look at it when you look at the story and you look at yourself you want it's like looking in the mirror <laughs> self reflection of your in a way of yourself you you're looking at it's like you, you're looking at yourself in the mirror and you're seeing your inner self. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing the things that uh, things that perhaps you would like to change or be better at, or things that you'd like to see others be better and transform. And so the the motive for that is to is to try to create character that uh, has some sort of a journey, mm -hmm. a journey of of change. It it starts someplace that is can be somewhat it can be unhappy, it can be disagreeable. Uh, it can be uh, frustrated, uh, but then eventually it moves to a revelatory place where yeah. 
like a light bulb goes off and then it goes to a place of transformation and the transformative place is the place where you get most of what you want to do accomplished yeah well i think that our listeners might might listen to what you just said and say oh yeah that sounds really easy and oh yeah that's that's a great solution but you said some things that are actually pretty profound if we were to rewind the tape and go back you know this idea of self-reflection i I think it's interesting, and one of my favorite storytelling gurus is Brian McDonald, and he, he's talked about that as, as well, that a lot of people nowadays are talking about self-expression. Like, mm -hmm. I have this thing that I want to express to the world, and, and he, he always feels that that's not the right way to go about it. And it sounds like what you're talking about is more what, what he thinks is the right thing to do, and that is self-exposition, or exposing yourself in a way. Self-exposing, exactly. Yeah, exposing like the, the weak and the vulnerable parts of yourself. That's correct. So when you talk about looking in the mirror and then putting that up on a screen, a lot of people don't want to put that up on the screen. They're That's right. We're afraid of that. That's correct. That it takes a lot of courage to be able That's to correct. do that. That's correct. Yeah. That's exactly right. It takes, it takes courage. It's, uh, it's, it's being naked. Yeah. You have, to, you have to be willing to become naked to be able to express yourself fully. Now, the actor knows this well. Mm -hmm. The actor is, is very experienced at this because they're taught this. They, they, they're, they're, it's driven into them in, in, uh, in, in schooling. Yeah. You want to be as naked as you can so you get to the pure self uh, image uh, uh, that it strips away everything. Mm -hmm. And then you layer that as you go with what you want to add, but you, you want to start with that pure yourself yeah and uh and, and then I, as i said it 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 is you do have to be courageous yeah. uh it, it's i mean I'm, i don't know if you're an actor i've done some acting myself and um uh it, it can be pretty tough it can be pretty tough when you have to expose yourself that way um and a lot of people can't can't uh, do that yeah animators are actors right. uh you know, uh, like Fred Moore, you know, you've seen the pictures, he, uh, some of the animators are looking in a mirror and they're drawing themselves. You know, it's like they're actually looking at themselves, <laughs> creating the characters. Yeah. It's I film them. video reference all the time. That's right. It's a reference of themselves. But then you go deeper into yourself and you find all the nuances and all the wonderful expressions and the comic things and the and the, and the storytelling and the st really mainly what's interesting in it for me animation is finding the comic the comic element in those characters you want to find that spark that <laughs> specialness you know and uh to give it life to bring it to life yeah. you know so that's something to look for yeah that's wonderful that's wonderful there's one thing you said that i wanted to touch on but i can't remember what it was <laughs> <laughs> but yeah yeah, I can't remember what it was, but we're about to the end of the show anyway. And uh, is there is there anything else you'd like to talk about before we end? Well, the main thing for me right now is the labor of love of the Puppetoon movie volume two. Uh, a lot of your viewers may not be familiar with the first one I did. It was the Puppetoon movie, the first one, which was a uh, feature, a film I did in 1987. Then it was released again and, re and uh, restored with lots of additional material. And then this was this this is really 35 years in the making. Right. Uh, and there will be a third one as well. There'll be a, we have to do a fundraiser for it, like I did for this, uh, to try to bring these things to the audience, people that have never seen these before. Uh, it's really an inspiration. Uh, so far, the reaction has been quite. I mean, it just came out a few days ago. Uh, people are buzzing with excitement. Yeah. Uh, revelation of waiting for this. A lot of people have waited to see these things since childhood. Yeah. Because they've not been seen before. Because they, where else can you see them? Can't see them. They've yeah. never been released before. And some of these have not, some have never been, been seen before. And certainly not in the quality that you see in this thing because they've been restored so beautifully. So I am putting a great deal of effort into this because it's very important to me uh, to the, give it to the world. It's a gift. It's a gift to the world to see uh, really a master master at work, to see things that inspired generations yeah. of animators, filmmakers, special effect artists, uh, all the way up till today. Yeah. And 
and that includes all the artists of today who've been inspired by George Powell, Steven Spielberg, who I did work on with on the Time Machine remake, George Lucas, James Ca James Cameron, Peter Jackson, yeah, uh, Tim Burton, everyone working today in film uh, owes a great debt to this little Hungarian sweet man who created the Puppetunes. And and you you've inspired something that I I'd like to actually end with in my mind that I think is really important. Nowadays we we look to what's popular and what's right in front of us and we keep taking that and making a copy of that and a copy of that and a copy of that and a copy of that. Where there's so much value in going back and finding DVDs like Puppetoons 2 or Puppetoons 1 or the Frank Capra films or or all of those those old masters and see what they were doing and then find out what they were inspired by and look at that. And the further you move back, the more you can realize, oh, this is how I can create something new and add something new to the world, is not by looking at what film was popular last year and copying that, but That's going right. back to the to all of the masters and studying what they do and figuring out how can I do that too. And in a self-exposing way <laughs> that takes a lot of courage, but it's worth it. I really think that if we're going to make the world a better place, we need to have better stories. We have to learn from the past to make a better future. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the perfect th way to end. Thank you so much for being on the show, Arnie. And check out the links in the show notes so that you can, can connect with him. And until next time, I hope we all get a little wiser. You have been watching the Directing Animation Livecast with Scott Weiser, produced by Lauren Chaikin, audio version edited by Kiera Horowitz, copyright Scott Weiser, LLC 2020.